Hey gang, what's a crack a lackin'? We are moving into a period known as the Gilded Age. I'm calling it Titans and Tramps. You may as well call it rich and poor, people who have a lot of money and people who are working for the folks who have a lot of money. You're asking first, what is the Gilded Age? What does it mean to be gilded? Mark Mark Twain actually came up with the phrase, the Gilded Age. Mark Twain is an author. He lived during the time. He's best known for his books such as Huck Finn. He says, the golden gleam of the gilded surface hides the cheapness of the metal underneath. So in other words, the Gilded Age is something that looks great on top, but when you probe a little bit deeper, you find out that it's not all it's cracked up to be. Recall why we had a civil war. The civil war was essentially a war over the West and about the future of the West. What is the Mexican cession, the land that we received from Mexico as a consequence of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? What is that going to look like? Is that going to be populated by capitalist free white laborers or is it going to be populated by slave plantations? Now, once the South secedes, the North gets to do pretty much whatever it wants in Congress because you've got all Northern Republicans up there. And so in 1862, the U.S. Congress passes a Transcontinental Railroad Act, which is going to be a great big federal improvement, a great big internal improvement. That's federal money to fund the construction of a rail line to link the East and the West. That land to the west was known to Americans as the Great American Desert. It wasn't a desert in the sense that the Sahara is a desert. It's a desert in the sense that it's deserted. Now, that's not really true. The American Indians still live there, the Plains Indians. But to the American imagination, this is a wild, untamed wilderness. It's got no trees. It's got very little water. And, of course, there are hardly any people out there. A transcontinental railroad can solve all of those problems, whatever you need. It can bring supplies, it can bring people. Well, one of the issues that the U.S. is going to face with regard to building these giant railroads is who's going to do it? Nobody has got the cash or the labor to pull this together. Where's the capital going to come from? No private investor is going to take such a huge risk. So the federal government takes it upon itself to give this land away. That's right. The federal government gives the land to Eastern Railroad companies. And what the railroad company is going to do is it's going to build its railroad through the West and then will be given additional money based on mileage and difficulty of terrain. So the federal government is really endowing these railroad companies with huge amounts of money and land, hoping that they will get it done and settle a continent. So what do you think is going to happen to land once a railroad company is going to build a major rail line through it? Well, think about what happens when a major interstate comes through a town. What happens is houses and buildings begin to develop because now the land is worth something. This is a major causeway from one place to the next, and people are going to want to be on that track to profit from it. And so then what happens to the value of the land? It obviously is going to increase. And then who gets rich when the land is sold to future settlers and businesses? The railroad tycoon. See, what the railroads did was they took the land grants from the U.S. government, and then they built the railroads, attracted the homes and the businesses, and then what they do is they would sell the land to anybody who's willing to buy. This could be eastern settlers, this would be southern settlers, and these could even be European settlers, anybody willing to buy the land. So, if you build it, they will come. Now, you might ask, is this in keeping with one of the classic principles of American economics, laissez-faire? Why or why not? I tend to think that it's not. 
It's not being done with private money. It's being done with government money. But nevertheless, who else was available to make such a huge undertaking happen? Does this mean that we shouldn't do it, though? Well, regardless of where you are on the economics of the whole situation, the Transcontinental Railroad is going to have two starting places. One train is going to start from Omaha, Nebraska, and the other train is going to begin from Sacramento, California. They are to meet at Promontory Point, Utah, which is just north of Salt Lake City, and they're going to do it in 1869 in an event known as the Wedding of the Rails. A huge event because officially the East and the West are linked together. And it's more than just a symbolic thing. They're going to be linked together economically, socially, and even culturally. The railroad building bonanza is going to continue throughout the late 19th century with railroads such as the Great Northern, which goes from Lake Superior to Puget Sound, built in 1883. You've got the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, constructed in 1884. And you've got the Southern Pacific, which goes from New Orleans to San Francisco, also in 1884. Now, every single one of these, and some others that I haven't listed, are going to be built with land grants from the federal government. That is, exception. the exception is the Great Northern. They did not use land grants. They actually built theirs for tourism. All of these are going to be part of an economic revolution. They're going to link the East and the West. Commercially, goods are going to flow quicker. And they're also going to unite the country economically as well as culturally. Once you're able to open up a catalog, say a Sears catalog, and look at the latest styles, anybody from Chicago to San Francisco is going to be able to have those fashions within a matter of weeks. And of course, this is going to make a lot of people a lot of money in the selling of Western lands, primarily the railroad companies. And some people are going to get super wealthy off of these railroads. So let's consider some of the consequences of the railroad. What happens to the speed of transport? Obviously, it's going to go a lot faster. And when goods and services are transported from one end of the country faster, what's going to happen to the prices? Prices are going to go down. So then what happens to the towns near the railroads? The population is going to increase. And what happens to the value of their land? It goes up. And then what happens to the product, to the demand for Eastern products? They're going to increase. And so what happens to Eastern retailers? They make some money as well. And then what happens as you develop the West? What happens to the demand for steel, wood, and other resources? They go up as well. And so what happens to Eastern industry? They also make some money. So for a lot of people, and not everybody, but a lot of people, these railroads are a win-win. So I want you to have a look at this advertisement here. This is a selection from the very first Sears and Roebuck and Company catalog. You still know them as Sears out at the mall. Have a look at the claims made by the advertisement. We sell everything by mail order. Your money will be promptly returned for any goods not perfectly satisfactory and we'll pay for freight and express charges both ways. So. Who do you think they're advertising to? Everything by mail order? Obviously, they're going to be they're going to be advertising to people who really can't make it to walk into the Sears and Roebuck company. They're going to be selling to people as far away as Utah and California. The railroads made this enterprise possible because Sears and Roebuck can now ship all of their goods on the railroads and people anywhere in the country are going to be able to enjoy them. Another consequence of the railroads is standardized 
time zones. In 1883, the major railroad companies got together and they said, we're going to go ahead and control time. This way, delivery routes can be confirmed and everything is going to go according to schedule. To me, this is a major testimony to the power that these railroads had, the economic and cultural power that they had to say that we can bend time ourselves. Before the railroads, time was a matter of local custom. And when you travel from one town to the next, you'd have to quick and check the time. Well, what time is it here? The railroads are going to standardize time throughout the nation, which is what's going to give us our time zones that we enjoy today. Now there's a lot of questions that come up with the railroads. One of the things that a lot of these railroad owners do, which people take a look at and wonder about, is something called stock watering. When they're going to be selling stock in their railroads, sometimes they're going to misrepresent the value of that stock, tell you it's a lot more uh, valuable than it really is so that they can get a higher price for it. Another thing these railroad companies begin to do is called pooling they combine with competitors so that they'll set prices and terms and so if a customer is looking around trying to find the best deal he's not going to find much difference between one competitor and the other another thing that they'll do is price gouging when for example one railroad goes down has technical difficulties or is having trouble making its schedule, another railroad may go ahead and double its price, realizing that you don't have a whole lot of option right now. Now, you have to ask, is this at the benefit of the railroad or of the consumer? Obviously, this benefits the railroad owner and the consumer is going to lose every time this happens. Now, should this be legal? Well, on the one hand, it is in the keeping of, it's, it's with the keeping of laissez-faire policy. We should not have laws that govern or regulate the marketplace. Is it legal in the 1880s? Well, the best way of answering that is to say it's not illegal. We simply don't have the precedent to deal with these sorts of things. This pie chart is showing us the distribution of wealth based on the type of occupation that you're in, the type of things you invest in. And as you can see, the railroads are winning out. The big money in the late 19th century United States is in the railroads at 40% of all the millionaires in the country. Take a look at the transition that the United States makes from 1880 to 1913. In 1880, the U.S. claimed just 14.7% of all industrial goods on the international market. By 1900, that jumps to 23.6%. And by 1913, the U.S. is claiming 32% of all industrial goods, making us the leader in industrial goods. Now, Who's responsible for all of this? As the captains of industry, and we're going to look at a couple of their personalities. We're going to look at somebody called Cornelius Vanderbilt, who made his fortunes on the railroads. Andrew Carnegie, who's the steel tycoon, made his fortune on something called Bessemer Steel. We're going to look at John D. Rockefeller, an oil tycoon who made the majority of his money in the oil business. And then there's J.P. Morgan, who's the financier. So we'll begin with Cornelius Vanderbilt. He's responsible for the railroad that's going to connect Chicago to New York. And he popularized the use of steel rails in his railroad, which made railroads safer and more economical. And for more information, I think this short video actually does it better than I could. So if you'll go to your Google Doc now and look at the short video on Cornelius Vanderbilt. It's an overview picture of Vanderbilt's Iron Empire stretching across a lot of the North and the Midwest.
And now we'll turn our attention to a guy named Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie is a Scottish immigrant. His parents are born in Scotland and they moved him over to the United States to Pennsylvania when he was just a child. And he got a job as a kid sweeping floors at a steel mill. Eventually he invested in that steel mill and it turned out to be a wise investment because he scored really big economically. He was able to open up his own steel factory and then he took another risk on what's called the Bessemer process in 1789. He didn't invent the Bessemer process. It's actually in, it was invented in England. And it's a process by which you can blow cold air onto steel in its molten form and take away a lot of the impurities, making it more durable and harder. Another thing that Andrew Carnegie did was he perfected a method known as vertical integration, and we'll get to that in a minute. He, does, he becomes the wealthiest man on the planet, and he retires in 1889 and becomes one of the world's top philanthropists, authoring something known as the Gospel of Wealth, again, which we'll get to that in a minute. So right now, if you jump to your Google Doc and look at the short video on the Bessemer process, So this is the process for which Andrew Carnegie is best known. It's called vertical integration. The definition is simply the method pioneers by Carnegie. When you combine into one organization all phases of manufacturing from mining to marketing, this makes supplies more reliable and improves efficiency. It controlled the quality of the product at all stages of production. So for example, Andrew Carnegie, who wants to make steel, says he's not just going to own the steel factory at the top, he's going to own every single step along the way. So he's all the way down to the iron mine, the limestone quarry, the coal mine, all of those steps are going to be owned by Carnegie. Well, this means he doesn't have to pay those people. He owns them himself, so he can control the costs. The shipping facilities, the railroads, those are also going to be owned by Carnegie. The steel mill, that will be Carnegie's too. And of course, the integrated steel company at the top, all of them controlled, owned by Carnegie. So as you can see, he's not going to have to pay anybody to do this work for him. From mine to manufacturing, he owns every single step of the process. And the consequences for Carnegie and for the United States are staggering. Look at what we're producing in 1875. Less than 1,000 tons of, of raw steel. By 1885, it's still very modest, not that much. Now, when the Bessemer process begins and really takes hold, he, he started to use it in 1879, but it takes a while for him to perfect it. And by 1885, or sorry, 1890, look at where we are as far as production of iron. By 1900, we jumped to 12,000. By 1910, 30,000 and 35,000 by 1915, making the United States and Andrew Carnegie the number one producer of steel on the planet. So we'll move on to our next industrialist. This is John D. Rockefeller. He's most responsible for establishing a giant corporation called Standard Oil, which comes to dominate 90% of the oil market in the United States in the late 19th century. For more on that, again, my video can do it better than I can, so don't turn to the small video on John D. Rockefeller on your Google Doc. The process by which John D. Rockefeller becomes known is called horizontal integration. It's a technique or an act of joining or consolidating with one's competitors to create a monopoly. And this is how Rockefeller became so wealthy. What he would do is he owned one oil company. I know that your uh, illustration there says steel companies, but uh, think of these as oil companies. And he would own one and he would send people over to sit on the board of directors, sort of as secret spies and control the operations in a way that would be favorable 
to Standard Oil. And eventually, Standard Oil would come to own the majority of that company and, and essentially take it over. And he would do these to a number of companies until, well, there was nothing left. And he created for himself a monopoly, which is why he was able to control 90% of the oil in the entire United States. Today, that's illegal. But in the late 19th century, there were no laws to prevent these things from happening. Now, the last guy we want to look at is known, his name is J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan made his money selling guns to the United States government during the Civil War. And what he does with that money is become, he becomes an investment banker. He loans capital to businesses that want to expand. So say you've got a good idea, but you don't have the money to make it happen, you can go to an investment banker who will float you a loan for a share of the price. So what he ends up doing is he facilitates the marriage between finance and industry through funding and taking a share of the profits. So if your business venture ends up being very, very successful, then JP Morgan makes some money as well and you would owe him a share of the profits. Now if it's not successful, both of you are out. But this is what he does. He's going to take enough risks in order to, to uh, make some money. And today we call that industrial venture capitalism. And this is big business for guys who have a lot of money to throw around. They raise funds and people will come to them saying, I've got an idea, I can look for oil here, or I've got an a invention I want to market here. All I need is the startup capital. And these venture capitalists will say, okay, and they'll take a look at it and decide if it's a good idea or a not, not a good idea. And they use the money from these, from these uh, adventures to venture more things. And this is what they do. Well, Morgan moves beyond simply being an investment banker. He moved rapidly to expand his industrial empire by taking Car Carnegie's holdings, adding others, watering the stock quite a bit. And in 1900, he launched the enlarged United States Steel Corporation, which was capitalized at 1.4 billion, making Carnegie's United uh, Carnegie's or now Morgan's United Steel Corporation the first billion-dollar corporation in America. Truly, the Industrial Revolution had come into its own. Now. All of this is being done under the economic principle or doctrine known as laissez-faire. And we talked about this at the beginning of the year. Laissez-faire means hands off, literally, let it alone. Allow the economy to run itself without any kind of government interference or at least very minimal government interference. So you have to ask yourself some questions about this. Would a laissez-faire capitalist object to child labor? Would a laissez-faire capitalist object to a minimum wage government or some other authority saying you have to pay your workers a minimum or a living wage? Would a laissez-faire capitalist object to safety regulations? Some other authority, a state or a federal government coming in saying you have to abide by these safety regulations. What about workers' compensation? If somebody gets hurt on the job working for you, do you owe them anything? And what about something like maternity leave? If you have a, a woman who's working for you and she becomes pregnant, um, do you owe her anything or is that just too bad, so sad? And so the great historiographical question is regarding these laissez-faire capitalists of the late 19th century. Are they better known as the captains of industry wise investors, shrewd businessmen who we can all look up to as heroes, or are they the robber barons, which is not a nice term. The, ro the robber barons, to say robber baron, goes back to medieval Germany 
and it would uh, refer to these to these German pirates who had essentially um, camp out on the River Rhine, and to any passerbys that would happen to fall across their pass, they would rob them of everything they had. And so the term robber baron is applied to the industrialists of the late 19th century. And so you can see the caption down there, history repeats itself. The robber barons of the Middle Ages and the robber barons of today. And there you have farmers and workers and businessmen and they're giving these guys their wages, giving these guys all they own. And you can see the fat guys up there. It says trust across their chest. We'll find out what that means. Uh, tariff and monopoly. Not a very good picture of what the robber barons or the captains of industry really are. Well, the philosophy guiding the captains of industry or the robber barons or the great industrialists or whatever you want to call them is, of course, laissez-faire. Laissez-faire, as one writer put it, is as individual competitors pursue their own maximum profit, they are all forced to be more efficient. Competition in all markets and with all goods is thus to be encouraged. Government intervention serves only to make operations less efficient and is thus to be avoided. So according to this doctrine, when industrialists compete, compete for customers, compete for your money, then they're enforced, they are forced to innovate, to improve, and become more efficient. See, if the guy down the street is running a shop and he's doing something better than I am, well, it's my business to compete with that if I want to keep your, uh, your patronage, if I want to keep you as a customer. I have to offer a good price and I have to make my product worthwhile. So also, according to this, we should then encourage competition because the consumer ultimately wins when businesses compete. We'll get a better product out of these guys. So we have to ask ourselves then, did the railroad industrialists operate according to the principle of laissez-faire? They were given government handouts to start out their businesses. Now, the other leading philosophy of the day is called social Darwinism. And that takes its name from uh, the great biologist Charles Darwin, and it applies it to the social sphere and to the economic sphere. Again, our writer says, the bright and able contribute the most to society, and so are to be encouraged and rewarded. The poor, the weak, and the handicapped demand more than they contribute, and so should not be supported, but be allowed to die a natural death. These ideas were applied to society just as Charles Darwin applied to biological life, hence the name social Darwinism. So, according to social Darwinism, the poor, that could be companies or people, should simply be permitted to die off naturally. Weak people can quite literally die and get out of the way, and weak companies can die or go out of business, thus paving the way for the stronger, the more efficient. So, according to social Darwinism, aid to small businesses or aid to people inhibits progress. Only the fittest, that is the strongest, should survive. Let's ask ourselves some questions about social Darwinism and about laissez-faire. Would a social Darwinist support something like welfare for the poor? Nope, really, a social Darwinist would not. As cruel as it may seem, and social Darwinists will admit this, welfare simply encourages the weak to survive, and that's going to inhibit progress. Would a social Darwinist support a graduated income tax? That would be the more money you make, the higher rate you should be taxed. And a social Darwinist again would say, no, why should I be punished for my success? Would a social Darwinist support the regulation of businesses? Uh, government coming in and setting rules or government coming in and tell them, telling them how to operate, what to pay people, what to make, things like that. Uh, no, 
A social Darwinist would not support those things because you should allow the market to run itself. You should allow businesses to self-regulate. This is in the interest of progress. What about this? Would social Darwinists support government bailouts for failing companies? In other words, here comes the government with a big bag of money going to bail out a company that needs some help. No, no. Weak companies, failing companies should die off because this, again, is in the name of progress. What about subsidies for certain industries deemed essential? No, no government handouts for businesses. They should be competing on the open market and they should have to deal with the consequences of their actions. With that in mind, I think it's time for a pop quiz. Which U.S. president signed the Emergency Stabilization Act, commonly referred to as a government bailout for the failing financial sector? Was it... Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, or was it Barack Obama? I'll give you a few minutes to think about it. The Emergency Stabilization Act, commonly referred to as a government bailout for a failing financial sector. In 2008, George W. Bush signed the Emergency Stabilization Act. What that did was it gave Congress the ability to spend $700 billion to purchase distressed assets, especially mortgage-banked securities, and supply cash directly to banks. This is to prop up the failing, I mean failing, financial sector in 2008. Yeah, it's a bailout. Now you ask, why did George W. Bush, who is generally known as a pretty uh, friendly to free markets, why would he do such a thing? Well, there wasn't a whole lot of options here because you're talking about people's mortgages, people's 401ks, people's entire lifetime savings are wrapped up in these securities. And if they were to fail, the whole country would fail with it. So you can fault George Bush for that. You can applaud George Bush for that. Um, there really isn't a whole lot of other, there were a lot of, not a lot of other options in 2008. So we're turning to our main narrative here. We look at something that emerges in the mid 19th century called a trust. A trust is a mechanism by which one company grants control of its operations through ownership of its stock to another company. Your best example of a trust is the Standard Oil Company owned by John D. Rockefeller. They became known for this practice in the 1870s as it eliminated its competition by taking control of smaller oil companies. In other words, a trust is when one giant company joins forces with another giant company and is then able to set prices. It's able to blacklist labor workers that they don't find uh, favorable to their uh, program. They're able to undercut competition and they're able to dominate an entire industry, thereby defeating the principle of laissez-faire. And guess what? We also call this a It's called a monopoly. The combination of businesses to undercut competition and maximize profit. Today, monopolies are illegal. When they first started to emerge in the late 19th century, we had no laws prohibiting monopoly. So this cartoonist is really dramatizing what standard oil is which is an, a giant monopoly. Look at the top. Standard Oil is morphed into this giant octopus and it's grabbing everything it can, including, as you can see, the White House and the Capitol building. Big government and big business are in bed with one another. Standard Oil controlling 90% of the oil markets in the U.S. They're a trust.
Now, at this point, one may ask, does the wealthy man, does the industrialist owe anything to society? Should he be paying it back? Andrew Carnegie says yes. And in 1889, he published what became known as the Gospel of Wealth, which he gives his advice to the industrialist for what to do at the end of his span of days. He writes, the duty of the man of wealth, first, to set an example of modest living, shunning display or extravagance, to provide for the, for the legitimate wants of those dependent on him, and after doing so, to consider all surplus revenues as trust funds, when he is called upon to administer to produce the most beneficial results for the community. The man of wealth is thus the mere agent and trustee for his poorer brethren, bringing to their service his superior wisdom, experience, and ability, doing for them better than they would or could do for themselves. So Carnegie is not a heartless robber baron. He believes that he has a social obligation to the community. He wants to endow primarily education cultural institutions, and better society as a whole. Now, Carnegie does not want to give direct aid to poor people. He's not in favor of welfare checks. He is a social Darwinist. And while he thinks that he does owe something to the society that has given him so much, he's not for giving people handouts. So Carnegie does, in fact, put his money where his mouth is, and he endows such major institutions that are still around us, with us today as Carnegie Mellon University, there with another industrialist named Andrew Mellon, Carnegie Hall, and Carnegie Museum, all of which you can visit today, and all of which were made possible by the generous endowments of Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie goes on in the Gospel of Wealth, he says, Those who would administer wisely must indeed be wise, for one of the serious obstacles to the improvement of our race is indiscriminate charity. It were better for mankind that the millions of the rich were thrown into the sea than so spent as to encourage the slothful, the drunken, the unworthy. Of every thousand dollars spent, and so-called charity today, it is probable that $950 is unwisely spent, so spent indeed as to produce the very evils which it proposes to mitigate or cure. So Andrew Carnegie is not in favor of direct aid for the poor. He would not be in favor of, say, welfare or food stamps or some of these things that a lot of people use to survive Andrew Carnegie calls this indiscriminate charity, and he says it's so spent, they only encourage the slothful, the drunken, the unworthy. So he's making a judgment call on a lot of people, and he's saying that direct aid, direct charity, direct welfare, whatever you want to call it, would only encourage the evils, produce the evils which it proposes to mitigate or cure. So let's have a look at how the other half lives. Well, not really the other half. Let's take a look at how the other 99.9% .9 live. Uh, before the Civil War, most American boys had owned to own a farm, a small business, or become an independent craft worker. But with the onset of industrializations, more Americans, both male and female, became accustomed to working for somebody else. The biggest draw in the urban north was industrial labor, and it drew folks from across the ocean, and it drew folks from the rural areas as well. Those who work in oil, steel, or construction, some of these big industries that grow up around oils or steel. The biggest draw in the west is the railroads and the construction projects that grew up around it. The south, well, the South, as we're going to look at in a future lecture, is rather economically stagnant. 
little investment or commercial innovation is coming to the South, and really the South will remain that way until after the Great Depression. Well, for your average worker, they make between three and twelve dollars a week, and they work ten to twelve, uh, ten to fourteen hours a day. There are no minimum wage laws. There's no workers' compensation, and there's no safety regulations being enforced in the workplace. So if you're going to go to work for one of the industrialists, you're going to work at your own risk. Some of the pictures of factory life, men and women working together, and you can see the industrial, uh, machine-like, mechanized nature of work in the Gilded Age. Well, in the Gilded Age, child labor is common and accepted. It's nothing new, by the way. Children have always worked. Children have worked longer than they've gone to school. They used to work on farms, and they were, used to work as field hands, and they used to work as apprentices. Uh, and so with the Industrial Gilded Age, it's really no big leap to say children should work in factories and in mines. Children were especially sought after because of their tiny little bodies. You can send children into mines to get after the precious gems a lot easier than grown adults. Children's small fingers can reach into machines and unjam them, and adults will have a harder time with this. So for children, this is a good thing. You want children to be working for you. In fact, one-fifth of all children work outside the home. In most places, late 19th century America, there are no compulsory school laws. Children are not made to go to school. In fact, most parents would suffer if children went to school because we need their income. Also during the Gilded Age, in 1890, 11 million of the nation's 12 million families earned less than $1,200 a year. Of this group, the average annual income was $380, which is well below the poverty line. The gap between the rich and the poor grew exponentially during the Gilded Age. The top 10% of income earners controlled 75% of the nation's wealth. One critic, his name is Henry George, said, the wealthy class is becoming more wealthy but the poor class is becoming more dependent. The gulf between the employed and the employer is growing wider. Social contrasts are becoming sharper. As liveried carriages appear, so do barefooted children. One of the ways to illustrate the changes that have taken place in the workplace in the Gilded Age is to look at the testimony of a machinist as he was being interviewed by the Senate Committee on Labor and Capital in 1883. Now, a machinist used to be somebody who was considered something of an expert in what he did. He operated a machine which only knew, he knew how to operate, and he knew the whole of the industrial production. So, for example, uh, he would have controlled the process from the raw materials to the final product, so he was more of an artisan. Now, with the new factory conditions that are in place, he's being asked how have things changed. The question before him, is there any difference between the conditions under which machinery is made now and those which existed 10 years ago? And he says, a great deal of difference. State the differences as well as you can. And the machinist answers, well, the trade has been subdivided and those subdivisions have been subdiv again subdivided, so that a man never learns the machinist trade now. Ten years ago, he learned not the whole of the trade, but a fair portion of it. In the case of the making of the sewing machine, for instance, you find that the trade is so subdivided that a man is not considered a machinist at all. And that way, machinery is produced a great deal cheaper than it used to be formerly. And in fact, through the system of work, 100 men are able to do now what it took 300 or 400 men to do 15 years ago. 
So he's saying that the process has been chopped up into tiny little pieces and that one man now only controls a tiny portion of the process and so you really can't call him a machinist at all anymore. You can't call him an artisan. He no longer has control over the means of production. Now he runs a tiny little piece of it. He might be the guy who tightens the screw as it runs past him and he tightens that screw all day long which makes his work far less valuable. It makes his work, uh, it, it requires far less education and training. And it also means that this poor guy is replaceable should anything happen to him and he's not able to do that job anymore. So the perspective that a lot of people begin to take is that you've got the robber barons up at the top, there's Gould, there's Vanderbilt, and they are sitting on this huge ship which is being carried by the workers. And you can see the symbols of industry below them, all, all these guys with their hammers and their pickaxes. They are holding up the wealth and the prosperity of the, of the uh, robber barons. What can one man do against an entire industry? If one man complains or if one man doesn't like his working conditions, if one man doesn't like what's happening to his trade, can he do anything? Well, no, one man can't do much. Individual workers are really powerless to battle single-handedly against giant industry. If they complain, if they say, I don't want to put up with these conditions, they can be easily fired and replaced. This cartoonist dramatizes the worker's plight well. He's tied to the stake and the stake reads monopoly. He is powerless to do anything. And who is it that's blowing the flames upon the guy? It's the robber barons themselves. In the caption, the worker is hopelessly bound to the stake at the mercy of the robber barons. This cartoonist cast the robber barons as pirates, and the caption below says, One sees his finish unless good government retakes the ship. And who is it that's walking the plank? It's Uncle Sam himself. It's democracy. It's the United States way of life, because these robber barons, these pirates, are raising the flag of monopoly of trust. So what's the answer? How can the average worker stand up to the big industrialist? What can he do? The answer will be found in labor unions. And you can see this is dramatized. This is not actually from the Gilded Age. It's from the 1950s, but I think it puts it very well. Labor unions say, united, we bargain. Divided, we beg. And that is absolutely true. United, come together, all of us together, we can negotiate with big business. One man can do very little. Well, what are their demands? What does organized labor want? They want things like an eight-hour workday. At this point, the industrialists could work you for as long as they wanted to work. And if you didn't like it, well, go find a job somewhere else. They want immigrant labor restricted because immigrants will come in and they will typically flood the job market and work for less. And so this will drive wages down. So, for example, the Irish, they'd like the, that labor to be restricted. And the Chinese coming in from the West and working on railroads, they would like that labor restricted. They would also want child labor restricted. And this isn't out of concern for children so much as it is to keep jobs open because when children can come in, again, children will often work for less money and this will drive wages down. So labor unions are going to want child labor to be restricted. And then, of course, they're going to want some kind of safety regulations or workers' compensation in the dangerous jobs like the mines and the factories.
As you can see, this cartoonist believes it's not a fair fight between capital and labor. Look at the tournament of today, a match between labor and monopoly. And poor labor there, his tiny little hat on, and the only weapon he's got is the strike, and he's astride this starving horse called poverty. And then look at the capitalist. Look at the iron horse that he is riding, obviously a symbol of the railroads. On it, it says Monopoly, and his little feather says Arrogance. And look who's watching and cheering him on, reserved for capitalists. And you can see Vanderbilt in there, and you can see some of the other railroad tycoons. So obviously, this cartoonist does not believe it's a fair fight between labor and capital, between the industrialist and his worker. Labor unions are going to endorse something that's called collective bargaining. You see, one guy standing up against the big business isn't going to be able to do much. He'll be fired or he'll be dismissed or something else. But standing together and bargaining together, the labor unions hope to get what they want. Because what are you going to do? Fire us all? What are you going to do? stop production, you'd have to hire everybody else and train everybody else, and you would lose money in the process. And so by joining together and using what is called collective bargaining, labor unions hope to get some demands met from the great industrialists. So we're going to look at three different labor unions. The first one, and the oldest one, is called the National Labor Union, founded in 1866. Secondly, we're going to look at a group called the Knights of Labor, founded in 1869. And lastly, the American Federation of Labor, also known as the AFL, founded in 1886. So let's look at the first one, the National Labor Union and their symbol of the raised fist. They were established in 1866, right after the Civil War, and they lasted approximately six years and they attracted nearly 600,000 members, not a small undertaking. It included everybody, almost, skilled and unskilled, laborers and farmers, even some women, and blacks. It did exclude the Chinese, though. What drove them out of business was the Depression of 1873. In a depression, when jobs become increasingly scarce, labor unions don't do so well. Uh, that put an end to the union, but not, impo not before they scored several victories. One was the establishment of an eight-hour workday for federal employees. That's not everybody. That's federal employees. So if you're receiving a government paycheck, you get to work eight hours. They also got this repealed, the Contract Labor Law. That was passed during the Civil War under the Abraham Lincoln administration to encourage the importation of labor. You see, when the factories were humming and we needed as many bullets and as many guns as, and as many uh, railroad cars as we could get, we needed an abundance of labor to make that happen. Um, when the war shut down and we no longer need all those things, it makes sense to the laborer to then repeal that contract uh, labor law, and they got that done as well. The next group is called the Knights of Labor, and in fact, that's short. Their official name is the Noble and Holy Order of the Knights of Labor. They're a little um, weird. They're a semi-secret society. They've got elaborate rituals, secret passwords, and, so said some, some went the rumor, satanic associations. I'm not sure that that last part is true, but that's some of the, the, the whisperings that went around about the Knights of Labor. They demanded an eight-hour workday. They wanted worker cooperatives. That means collective bargaining. And, believe it or not, equal pay for men and women. Now, they're a little more restrictive. They're going to exclude blacks and the Chinese. Now, they rejected the idea that wage earners would remain wage earners for life. They urged workers and owners to share ownership of the means of production, which cast them more as socialists. Not 
entirely a socialist organization, but they're more to the left of the spectrum than um, a lot of other folks demanding things. They won some pretty big victories over the railroads. They kept their wages high, and their numbers grew to an astounding 700,000 members by 1886, and they were well on their way to becoming the largest and most respected labor union in American history. Was it not for the Haymarket Square incident in 1886? This will signal the end of the Holy Order of the Knights of Labor. Now, what happened at the strike at Haymarket Square in Chicago was that ordinary workers were striking against wage cuts at the McCormick Harvester Company, which is not terribly important. What is important is that there's a lot of organized laborers here. There's a lots of different groups here. There's a lots of different moving parts to this protest. It's, of course, supposed to be nonviolent. The Knights never endorsed armed conflict, but somebody, nobody knows who, threw a bomb into the crowd and over 100 people were hurt, including several policemen. Uh, modern historians have probably connected the work to an anarchist group in Chicago at the time, and uh, therefore, thereby really acquitting the Knights of Labor of any of this, but it didn't matter. In the eyes of the public, the Knights of Labor bear the responsibility and they become associated with radicalism and with violence. And with the Knights of Labor discredited in the public eye, the banner carriers of labor are going to be the much more conservative, much more tame, much less controversial AF of L, the American Federation of Labor. They are an alliance that unified the strategy for various independent self-governing national unions. So it's like a union of labor unions, unions, a confederacy of unions, if you will. The leader is a man named Samuel Gompers, and you do need to know his name. Samuel Gompers is a former cigar maker who came to America as a teenager, and he served as the president of the AFL every year except for one until he died in 1924. Now, unlike the Knights, he's going to stay away from political associations, especially anything that smacks of socialism. He is not going to say that workers should own the means of production. He's not going to say anything close to there should be a violent revolution or any kind of revolution in the economy. Rather, he says his goal is the bread and butter changes. We're not interested in institutional revolution. By bread and butter, he wants an eight-hour workday. He wants safety regulations, he wants workers' liability, and he wants what's called closed shops, which means that you cannot be employed at a certain place unless you join a union. Now, it's important to realize that when Samuel Gompers is saying all this, he is not agitating for government change. He wants to deal directly with capital. He wants to deal directly with the business owners, the shop owners, the railroads, whatever, and negotiate with them. So he's not advocating for institutional government change. His tactics are, of course, the strike, the walkout, um, the sit-down strike, and he's going to, in no uncertain terms, denounce violence and denounce revolution. Samuel Gompers wrote in 1889, You know, or ought to know, that the introduction of machinery is turning into idleness thousands faster than the new industries are founded. And yet machinery should certainly not be either destroyed or hampered in its full development. The laborer is a man. He is made warm by the same sun and made cold, yes, colder, by the same winter as you are. He has, had a, he has a heart and a brain and feels and knows the human paternal instinct for those depending upon him as keenly as you do. What shall the workers do? Sit idly by and see the vast resources of nature and the human mind be utilized and monopolized for the benefit of the comparative few? No, the laborers must learn to think and act 
and soon too that only by the power of organization and common concert of action can either their manhood be maintained, their rights to life be recognized, and liberty and rights secured. So Samuel Gompers here, if you look closely, he's not saying we need a socialist revolution. He's not saying that we need institutional change. He is addressing his comments directly to the factory owners, to those who control the means of production. And he's asking for a piece of it, not to own it. He's asking for a piece of it. And what is he going to use? Collective action, collective bargaining, organization, and common concert of action. This is Samuel Gomper's primary goal, is to get unions, get laborers, get workers to organize and exert their pressure exert pressure on the factory owner directly the individual cannot stand the individual cannot make this happen A major event happened in 1877, which really made a lot of people look very closely at the labor situation in the United States. It was called the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. If you look, the total number of railroad track in the United States increased from 23 in 1830 to 35,000 in 1865. That's a pretty huge jump. By the early 20th century, railroads employed one out of every 25 American workers. But the financial panic of 1873, that's that same financial panic that led the Republican Party to abandon its commitment to civil rights, that financial panic led railroads to fire workers that cut wages by up to 20%, while increasing the hours for those who, rem for those who remained. So what they want is for people to work harder for less money. Now, workers responded all across the country by walking off the job, and then the strikes turned violent in places like Baltimore, Chicago, Kansas City, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, and San Francisco. So this is a huge nationwide railroad strike, and it's affecting a lot of different cities and, of course, a lot of different commerce. The goal of the strike was to halt production, to basically stop the economy from running until the owner or the manager meets the demands of the workers and what they want is their wages not to be cut. Well, as the images made clear, the strike was a really huge nationwide event. It ended up killing more than 50 people and cost 40 million in damages. Most of this was to property owned by the railroads. It had the intended effect of shutting down the economy, and it cost U.S. businesses millions in revenues all over the country. The strike was eventually put down, not by meeting the workers' demands, not by the business owners agreeing, but by a combination of state and federal forces. Notice police force is putting down the Great Railroad Strike. Governors in 10 states mobilized 60,000 militia members to reopen rail traffic. And President Rutherford B. Hayes authorized the use of federal troops to suppress the riots and reopen the rail lines. So notice what is happening. The government, both state and federal government, are coming down very hard on the side of capital and not of labor, and they're using police action to put down the strike. In the aftermath, the government created the National Guard. You may have heard of them today. The National Guard is still around, and they are not Suppose that in, in initially they are not there to prevent the United States from foreign invasion. The National Guard is to prevent these railroad workers from striking and halting the economy. And the National Guard throughout the 1880s and 90s is going to be on strike patrol. 
If we look at the New York Times editorial right after the strike, this is July in 1877, you'll see that the um, average reader, I guess, of the New York Times does not have a very positive view of what these strikers were intending to do. They write, the strike is apparently hopeless and must be regarded as nothing more than a rash and spiteful demonstration of resentment by men too ignorant or too reckless to understand their own interests. But if the strike on the Baltimore and Ohio Road is a foolish one, its history up to the present time shows that those who are engaged in it are not only bold and determined, but that they have the sympathy of a large part of the community in which they live. So the New York Times is a bit skeptical of the strike and at the same time is a bit afraid of the strikers. Now another force that comes to national attention following the railroad strike is called the Pinkerton Detective Agency. They're a private army and a detective agency founded by a man named Alan Pinkerton. He founded it uh, before the Civil War in 1851 and after the strikes in the Industrial Age it rises to national attention. What he does is he is hired by the railroads and big industrialists to infiltrate labor unions. So Pinkerton will pick some of his mess best men and send them into the ranks of laborers at say Carnegie Steel Plants or uh, Rockefeller's Oil and They'll put their ears to the, to the ground and see what they can hear and see what they can see and hear what they can hear. Uh, at one point, Pinkerton's detective agency and private army is larger than the U.S. Army. They've got spies everywhere, eyes and ears everywhere. Alan Pinkerton wrote after the railroad strike of 77, he says, a good deal has been written and said regarding the causes of our great strike of 77. To my mind, they seem clear and distinct. For years, all manner of labor unions and leagues have been forming. No manufacturing town nor any city has escaped this baleful influence. Though many of these organizations have professed opposition to communistic principles, their pernicious influence has unconsciously become powerful among them. Other organizations have openly avowed them. They have become an element in politics. So Pinkerton's views are clear. These labor unions, trade organizations, what have you, they are communist. They may not say so, but their principles are openly communist and they must be defeated. A similar position is put forth this time from the pulpit by the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher of the famous Beecher family of Calvinist preachers. He says, the trade, that is the labor union, which organized under the European system destroys liberty. I do not say a dollar a day is enough to support a working man, but it is enough to support a man, not enough to support a man and five children if he insists on smoking and drinking beer. So the Henry Ward Beecher obviously believes that a lot of these folks involved in strikes and labor unions are deluded by a European system, and he seems to believe that they're lazy. They don't want to work, they just want to sit around smoking and drinking beer. Why else would they be striking? Why else would they want these higher wages? In the late 1880s and 1890s, a lot of Americans, especially working class Americans, begin to take a very skeptical view of their government, believing, as the cartoon in front of you suggests, that the Senate, you can see all the senators, they're hard at work, are really being controlled by the money interests. You see the big fat cats behind them, the Steel Beam Trust, the Cooper Trust, Standard Oil is back there. You see the Sugar Trust, the Coal Trust, the Nail Trust. Anybody that makes anything is controlled by a trust. And so a lot of Americans begin to believe that it, it's really trusts that are controlling government and not government working for the people. So we're going to take a look at another major event. This one happened in 1894 called the Pullman Strike.
The Pullman Palace cars were a rail train known for luxury, quality of service. It was sort of like a cruise ship today. They're owned and operated by a man named George Pullman of Chicago, and they've got a hefty price tag. If you want to ride in a Pullman Palace car, you're really going to have to have some money. Now, in 1894, one of the most notable walkouts in history occurred in Pullman, Illinois, where the Pullman Palace car housed its employees. That's right, they housed their employees, putting them up in dormitories and really micro cities in order to keep a closer eye on them and prevent strike activity. George Pullman was hit really hard by the Depression, and he decided to cut wages by 25 to 40 percent, a tremendous cut for the average worker. But what he did was he maintained rent prices for company housing. So you couldn't live anywhere else. You couldn't, uh, you, you, you didn't have any other means, any other place to go. And what George Pullman is going to do is going to cut your wages by 25 to 40 percent, but your rent is going to stay the same. This is going to be unacceptable to a lot of workers. And so they, be, they decide to strike. And the person you want to keep your eye on, he's going to show up several more times in several more lectures. His name is Eugene V. Debs. So because he's going to become so influential in American history, let's take a closer look at who Eugene V. Debs is. He is, in 1894, not a radical, not a socialist. He imbibes the small town values of the upwardly mobile skilled workers in the railroad brotherhoods. He believes in the strong Protestant work ethic of industry, frugality, sobriety, and benevolence. He's essentially the descendant of the free labor movement, believing that a man, an individual man, should be able to make his way in the world through the sweat of his brow and his own skill. He believes in independence and the community and the autonomy of the common man. He believes that these values keep the American Republic from degenerating into various forms of tyranny. He believes that individualism cannot be achieved in isolation from his fellow workers. He accepts a condition of mutual dependence, was not a negation of manliness, but a higher form of it, that is, brotherhood. So follow me, in the 1880s, and 1890s. He becomes a leading strike leader and this is what leads him to take up arms with the Pullman strikers in Chicago in 1894. Well, George Pullman is going to appeal directly to the federal government for aid in putting down this strike. And President Cleveland, who is in the White House at the time, responds by sending in four 15,000 federal troops to, as to not have a repeat of 1877. He goes further and nationalizes the police and the militia in 27 states to put the strike down. 34 strikers are shot and Eugene V. Debs is imprisoned. can see the Chicago strikes, United States infantry in the stockyards to hell with the United States government. That would be a quote from the strikers, obviously, not the federal troops. The question that goes before the Supreme Court is, does the federal government have the power to use force, to use the army to nationalize troops in order to break up a strike. And so in the court case, re Debs, that means concerning Eugene V. Debs of 1895, a year following the Pullman strike, the unanimous decision of the Supreme Court is yes, yes, the government does have the authority to break up strikes using police power. Let's look at its reasoning why. It is obvious that it is not the province of the government to interfere in any mere matter of private controversy between individuals or to use its great powers to enforce the rights of one against another. Okay. The national government, given by the Constitution power to regulate interstate commerce, that's essential. The national government, the federal government, has the power to regulate interstate commerce. This is in the Constitution. 
has by express statute assumed jurisdiction over such commerce when carried upon the railroads. It is charged, therefore, with the duty of keeping those highways of interstate commerce free from obstruction. For it has always been recognized as one of the powers and duties of a government to remove obstructions from highways under its control. So the answer is yes, because the government has the right and the obligation to regulate interstate commerce and to keep those rail lines open, then yes, the government can use the army and nationalized troops and use them to put down workers. Well, Eugene V. Debs goes to prison, and it's not going to be the last time Eugene V. Debs goes to prison. And he reads Karl Marx. If you don't know, Karl Marx, along with Friedrich Engels, are the authors of the Communist Manifesto, which is a very important book in uh, uh, European history and certainly in world history. And there in prison, Debs radicalizes saying, the issue is socialism versus capitalism. I am for socialism because I am for humanity. And so Eugene V. Debs makes a public conversion to the socialist cause and swears to abolish capitalism. And we certainly are not done hearing the end from Eugene V. Debs. Let's go back to the text of the 14th Amendment and have a look. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. Look at that again. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. I should have highlighted that last part. Read it again. No state is going to deny anybody equal protection of the laws. Now remember the original intent of the 14th Amendment was to recognize the citizenship of freed slaves and provide them with equal protection under the laws. Anybody born as a citizen and is entitled to equal protection under the laws, which means that if you're a citizen of the United States, that means your life, your liberty, and your property, none of those things can be taken away without due process. Very important amendment, very important one. I'm sure none of us want to do without the 14th Amendment. In 1886, the Supreme Court is going to deal with a court case in which the 14th Amendment is going to play a very curious role. It's an important court case because it establishes a precedent that is still being argued today. The case begins with the Southern Pacific Railroad Company. The Southern Pacific says that the state constitution only allows taxes on the franchise, the roadway, uh, roadway, roadbed, rails, and rolling stock. It points directly to the Constitution and says this are the only parts that the county, that the state, can tax. Now, the state of California taxes the fences owned by the Southern Pacific Railway Company. Notice the fences. Now, the Southern Pacific Railroad is going to point to the fences. That's not part of what the Constitution says. And so Southern Pacific refuses to pay the taxes on its fences. Well, Santa Clara is going to bring action against the Southern Pacific in court, and they're going to argue this. They're going to say, since it could tax the land which situates the fences, it could also tax the additional value of the land added by that fences. So in other words, you put these fences up on the land that increased the value of the land because it improved the land and what we get to do is we get to levy additional taxes on you because you have improved the land. Well, obviously the Southern Pacific Railroad is going to disagree with this and it's going to go all the way up to the Supreme Court.
So just to clarify, the question before the court is this. Does the California Constitution allow the state to increase taxes on railroad companies when the companies added additional value to the property by building fences? The decision is no. The state tax board increased taxes on the, proper, on the property based on an arbitrary measure of the value added by the fences. In other, way, in other words, one cannot take away the property of a person without due process. A what? A person. You heard. The majority decision in the Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad said, in determining the meaning of any act of Congress, unless the context indicates otherwise, the words person and whoever include corporations, companies, associations, firms, partnership, societies, and joint stock companies as well as individuals. What has just happened here? Well, according to the Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad case, a corporation, an association, a firm, a partnership, a society, a joint stock company is a person recognized by law as having the same rights as any other person. And of course, that would mean the 14th Amendment applies. No state shall deny to any person equal protection of the law, which means corporations are people recognized by the law. All people have an equal protection under the law, including a right to property. And so the state of California cannot arbitrarily take away Santa Clara County Railroad, I'm sorry, the Southern Pacific Railroad's property without due process.